at 291 Fifth Avenue. And this is the location where, in 1905, Alfred Stieglitz opened his little gallery that was originally known as the Little Galleries of the Photo Secession. But this became the first modern art gallery in New York City. And if you are a forensic pathologist and you wanted to know where the virus of modernism entered into the cultural body of America, it was right here, 291 Fifth Avenue in 1905. People in his gallery included Marsden Hartley, John Marin, Arthur Dove, and Georgia O'Keeffe. He's come to be regarded by many as an artist of places and things. Flowers, bones, buildings, desert landscapes. But in this exhibition, we take another look at an artist that we all think we know. Reassessing O'Keeffe, we find a painter who adopted abstraction as a primary and personal language um, as early as 1915, and something she continued for more than 50 years. As she said in 1923, her goal was to make the unknown known. By unknown, she said, I mean the thing that means so much to the person that wants to put it down. To clarify something he feels, I notice that she says he, um, it should be she feels, but does not clearly understand. By focusing on O'Keeffe's abstractions rather than her representational works, mm -hmm. this exhibition is an overdue acknowledgement of O'Keeffe's place as one of America's first abstract artists. One of the largest exhibitions of O'Keeffe's works up to the present, Georgia O'Keeffe Abstraction includes 125 works, which are paintings, drawings, watercolors, and sculptures. We've got an exhibition that's over 20 years in the making. And this is the abstractions of Georgia O'Keeffe. I believe it was organized by Barbara Haskell. This is titled For Music Special, and I believe this may be the earliest piece in the show. This is a charcoal from 1915. These are some of the very early charcoals that she did in 1916, and they kind of set the tone for her next 30 or 40 years of abstract work. There's some beautiful early watercolors. I'm an amateur art historian, but uh, I really love opportunities like this to have a chance to take a real in-depth view of probably the half dozen or dozen great American art artists that uh, got the whole modernist ball rolling here in New York. And yet, when Stieglitz receives this work, he, he sees it um, as, a, as an expression of two people, two lives. Her mother has just died, um, and he titles this work Two Lives, and refers to it in letters as hurt and pain. And to me, that's the, the essence of O'Keeffe. Yes, she was looking at these buildings, but the buildings became a springboard to something actually more profound. I believe there's also a very interesting aspect of this that uh, is dealing with just the whole question of abstraction and who was actually the first uh, artist or artists who started doing abstraction, whether it was Kandinsky in Germany or Man Ray Dawson in Chicago or people like Arthur Dove and George O'Keefe here in New York. And I believe that one of the reasons that there's a certain confusion about the work of George O'Keefe is because although some of the work is very abstract, a lot of it does have references or allusions to landscape, still life. Very stiff. And she's using short zigzag brush strokes so that she can diffuse the light in all possible directions, bringing that bright value forward in the composition. 
making it reflect a tremendous amount of light. And then when she wants the light to absorb right through the canvas and pop back out, she's using translucent cream forms. This control of paint is, is deliberate, starting in the very beginning, so that she can control the way the light reflects through the paint, off the canvas, but also to direct how your eye moves across the composition. Hmm. The, the photographs, even in 1921, you can almost imagine them, were, were very radical. O'Keefe was, at that point, living with Stieglitz. He was an older, 25, 23, some, 23 years older, still married. And as one of the critics at the time, Henry McBride, said, she became an overnight celebrity. It put, you know, everyone knew her name. It put her on the map. But it put her on the map in a way it was a double-edged sword. Everyone knew her name. So that was great. But everyone then associated her as this very sexual free spirit. I was just speaking with Stephen Kaplan and he said, he can't believe how vaginal so much of the imagery in this show is. But in a certain way, I would have to say that that does kind of bring up Georgie O'Keeffe as maybe the godmother of feminist art, at least in New York. When this same series was included in the Whitney Show in 1970, the feminist artists and art historians adopted her as a heroine because she was, in their minds, the first um, person to represent a sort of female iconography with this circular form in the middle of a composition, when in fact many of her pictures earlier than this had this. But it also carries a much bigger meaning in her mind. She resisted what the feminists said in the 70s. She refused to cooperate with any of their exhibitions or projects because in her mind, it sounded too much like what the men had said about her work in the teens and 20s. So she was always trying to assert her autonomy and her independence. And I think these are ways of poking fun at the critics. This is something unusual. This is a sculpture titled Abstraction from 1916 was cast in 1979-80 into bronze. It's probably about 10 inches high. French TV. They sort of talked about it. The fact that a lot of people in the art world consider George O'Keefe a little kitschy. A little too popular. A little too easy to understand. At least as far as the the hardcore art intelligentsia and I'm sort of hoping that this show will display some of her more innovative and daring abstract subjects she was working with. And in one of the letters uh, to Stieglitz she writes about seeing the most incredible sunset that looked like a hot pink kiss coming down on the horizon. And for me, I said to Barbara, this is that hot pink kiss painting, you know. Um, and, in, and in some ways, we've uh, looked at a lot of her paintings from both directions. You know, and so, sometimes O'Keefe played with orientation, and you could move things horizontally or vertically. And with this one, uh, you know, when you turn it on its side, it almost does become like that horizon line. But by putting it vertically, it just creates the most kind of incredibly unusual uh, sensuous, hot, pink kiss. <laughs> Georgia O'Keeffe lived a very long time. I believe she died in 1986 at the age of 98. And she started painting at a very young point. So we're actually looking at something in the neighborhood of 65 years of work. This particular gallery features some of the last of her abstract paintings from the 50s. And this was all happening, she was out in New Mexico, but this was all happening while people like Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock were becoming the new superstars. This is James Calm coming to you from the Whitney Museum. And we're taking a look at George O'Keefe abstractions. Thanks, Kate.